Hey everyone, Michael at RPG Imaginings here, and it's been a while since I posted a video, but I uh, had a little bit of time today, and I got these two packages in the mail, and I thought that this might be a good time to do an unboxing. Um, probably the biggest news from a role-playing perspective for me over the last year is that uh, I've really uh, started to expand my collection into Call of Cthulhu, which is one of my most famous one of my most favorite role-playing games, and uh, I had dabbled on and off for for many years uh, in uh, checking out Call of Cthulhu books and reading up a little bit on what's available, and with the advent of drive through RPG and uh, <clears throat> services that are allowing fans to publish a lot more material, there's just been a real revitalization of Call of Cthulhu since 7th edition came out. And so what you're going to see here is not fan-related material, but I think that fan-related material and Kickstarter is really pushing a lot of the uh, interesting adventures uh, that are coming out for Call of Cthulhu uh, scenarios that Keepers can play. And so uh, I had ordered these uh, two packages with books because I've also been in the habit lately of trying to recycle game material that I'm not using. And so, for example, I had like three major commander decks that had been released uh, by Wither Wizards of the Coast for Magic the Gathering. Um, I had like a 2013 deck, 2014, 2015, and I haven't really played commander in over a year and a half. Um, and it's not like I don't have the opportunity to play commander. The format just isn't in as interesting to me as uh, thematic constructed. Um, <clears throat> I play more like Legacy for Magic the Gathering, um, I use any cards that are at my disposal. I don't pay attention to any uh, legal lists or anything like that. And so um, I, since I wasn't playing Commander, I'm like, why do I really need all the fanciest cards for these Commander decks? I'm not really getting anything out of them. And so by selling just you know, like two dozen cards from those three commander decks uh, that that were fairly valuable, I was able to get like 60 bucks that I decided to put into Call of Cthulhu role-playing materials. And so uh, this first one, I think I purchased off of Amazon's be Amazon because it's an example of something that is a lesser known campaign for Call of Cthulhu. And I had purchased it uh, because the price drop on it was significantly more dramatic uh, than a lot of books. But uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't mineable material for me. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out here is that I'm fortunate enough that I have a regular Call of Cthulhu group that I've been uh, working with. Um, over the the last uh, several months and we're now seven sessions in and that's one of the longest periods of time that I've ever run a campaign with a group of people um, with me as GM anyway and uh um, you know I've been fortunate that I've been able to game a lot with uh, some friends um, uh, we have a long-standing campaign now that's, you know, going on a solid decade, I think, or more right now, and that's awesome, Star Wars role-playing. Um, but um, we're all sort of scattered throughout the United States, and so as a result of that, I've had to... Um, basically make my own way role playing wise and and also you know this is the game that I'm most interested in, in right now and it's it's not everybody's cup of tea so um what we should have here is one of the uh supplements that I purchased with my little hobby recycling that I did recently and so I just wanted to share those with everybody um I've sort of become a bit of a Call of Cthulhu collector over the last 2 years or so and so this first one which I got for a rock bottom price. I think I paid like less than $15 for this. And it's a full campaign book. This is uh, uh, Call of Cthulhu 6th edition Terror from the Skies. A race to save humanity from a dark future. Ooh, let's check it out. Sorry about the dogs barking. And so this one. Um, We'll check the publication date in a second, but the Lovecraftian mythos is populated by many creatures, both singular entities such as Cthulhu and Haster, more on Haster a little bit later in the video, and creatures who number in the millions. The Shan are an ancient insect-like alien race fleeing a destroyed homeworld. I think in this supplement, the Shan is actually referring to the, um, gosh, it's not the Mego, 
the Migo are, are fungi in the, um, in the Call of Cthulhu world. Anyway, the Shan is a reference to another common Call of Cthulhu baddie. Um, I want to say maybe it's a reference to the Elder Things or something. Anyway, it's forced into nomadic life. They are scattered throughout space. Eons ago, a number of Shan arrived on Earth, but certain properties in our sun's light weakens them. Trapped, these first arrivals fell into idleness and decadence, acting only by seeping into the sleeping minds of human beings. And so what we have here is uh, Terror of the Skies is a full campaign that... um, I'm probably never going to run this campaign, but I really like it from the perspective of um, uh, mineable material that I could use. And when I was reading the table of contents page for this on Drive Through RPG, um, that was something that uh, some of the titles for these these adventures and the nature of this module really caught my eye. And so, a whippy vampire. Vampires can be can be very variable. <laughs> Uh, in Call of Cthulhu, and I, I'm going to be interested to, s- to see what the, the take is on this. And so um, I largely prefer physical books uh, to uh, PDFs, but as you're going to see a little later on in the video, um, that doesn't mean that I don't like having a PDF as a backup. But uh, this is like recreational reading for me as I'm trying to fall asleep at night. And so um, what we have here is is basically a multi... Um, multi-scenario campaign that I will really look forward uh, into diving into. And so one of the things that I love about Call of Cthulhu is that uh, the game really prioritizes handouts for players, and and it's an investigative game by nature, so you sort of need those sorts of things. But here we have Frederick Davis's letter. And uh, for those who know me, I've also done uh, recently a uh, part of the reason why I haven't posted as much on this channel is that I've had the benefit of being able to do a um mysterious sort of mysterious package uh mailing for my group of friends and uh so I've been sending them little clues in the mail for our Call of Cthulhu game that is coming up in September uh for uh Noncon, our non conventional game convention that we run. And so you can see all sorts of interesting handouts that that you know you'd you'd uh you'd hand out to your players for this and so yeah this is basically just a series of linked adventures that form a campaign and uh, i do believe that this is a globe trotting campaign like many call of cthulhu campaigns that uh uh go across uh um many locales and so it looks like we're now in an adventure that's in britain and then we uh pop uh, over to newcastle um city in britain and so, uh, yeah, Helio Wall. Ooh, this one is going to take place on a Zeppelin. And so I think uh, we saw on one of the inside pages there that there was, uh, yep, Graf Zeppelin. And so there's information on, going to be information on the Zeppelin somewhere in here. You know, having interesting locales is always a great thing for planning adventures. I mean, even if I were never to run this campaign, I view this all as mineable material for role-playing games. And so here we have the railway system. Uh, Looks like for Eastern England, because we have the North Sea right here. And so uh, looks like the majority of this campaign is actually taking place in in England. It's it's not as uh, globetrotty as I thought it was. But um, uh, so this is Northern England, because there's an arrow here pointing to York, and York is obviously near the north of England. and uh, in terms of recognizing cities here, I don't see any southern Scottish cities. And so I think this is still all within England, this particular campaign. And so there we go. This was a nice purchase, Terror from the Skies. And so I'll look forward to doing some recreational reading on that. But let's go ahead and continue the unboxing. This is a bigger one because uh, this one you can see is direct from Chaosium and wherever possible... I've been trying uh, to order books directly from Chaosium because when you purchase a book from Chaosium, the publishers of Call of Cthulhu, they not only send you the physical book, but you also get an email link that uh, gets you access to a really nice, nicely indexed PDF that you can use in addition to the books. And so there should be two books in here um, that... Uh, I had been thinking about for a very, very long time, and these were both very well 
uh, reviewed. One of these is one of the last 6th edition Call of Cthulhu products that came out before 7th edition was re-released. And so those of you in the audience who are familiar with Call of Cthulhu may know um, what I'm talking about. And uh, the other one is one that this is, I ordered the 2nd edition of this book and it's... Um, sort of a mini campaign that is unique in that it spans over three different eras. Now, Chaosium always does a spectacular job of packing things so that you know that your books are going to arrive um, in great shape. And so sometimes this cardboard is on the outside. In this case, we had an outer paper container and cardboard on the inside. I've Rarely seen it done this way, but hey, if the books get here in great shape, I don't care how they do it, so long as it's nicely packed. And so, um, we'll just do our little slicey dicey, hopefully without damaging any of the products in the inside. And then this is, I think I just need to do this. Different people get different. Oh, there we go. There we go. And so. Our two books from this unboxing are, and they have arrived in excellent condition, are The House of Rillier, Five Scenarios Based on Tales by H.P. Lovecraft. And of course, for those of you who may not be as uh, knowledgeable about Lovecraft's work and Cthulhu, Rillier is the dreaming city where Cthulhu has been imprisoned. Um, and then... Ripples from Carcosa, three scenarios exploring Haster, Carcosa, and the King in Yellow. And what's interesting about Ripples from Carcosa is that uh, this particular supplement, these three scenarios are sort of time hop, hop scenarios in which the idea behind it is that, you know, all the great old ones <clears throat> in the Cthulhu uh, universe are uh, basically timeless beings. You have no hope of defeating them, and they exist in all time periods. But that means that from a narrative standpoint, it's always really interesting to visit the same sort of threats in different time periods. And so let's start here with Ripples from Carcosa. Um, so if we look at our table of contents, there's a nice little section here on Haster, the yellow sign, and the king in yellow. Uh, the king in yellow, of course, is a play that was uh, written by a guy. Um, I should probably know this for the purposes of this review. But the king in yellow is an actual play that was written that supposedly turned people who viewed the play mad when they watched it. Um, and so I'm just going to uh, turn over in the introduction here to see if we have some some actual references to the actual... Um, here we go. So Guide to uh, Haster and the King in Yellow. Um, so let's see if we can find the precise information about the actual play, the King in, in Yellow. Um, so... I'm sure it's somewhere. Oh, here we go. All right. So, um, the original edition was seized in blah, 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 blah. I think that this might be in-game flavor text. Anyway, suffice it to say, there was an actual play called The King in Yellow that was, uh, here we go, that was supposed to, um, uh, Cause people to go mad when they viewed it, and I'm blank. I'm I'm having difficulty right now finding the actual author for it. But um, anyway, the the different time periods in which this is taking place is so Adventus Regis. Um, this is a um, Roman era scenario um, for Cthulhu Invictus. Herald of the King in Yellow is a Cthulhu Dark Ages scenario. And when we'll turn to it, we'll see if I'm right about this. I don't quite remember. But Heir to Carcosa, I'm pretty sure, is a far future um, Call of Cthulhu scenario. And so um, we have this guide to Haster, the yellow sign, and the king in yellow. Um, for those of you who are not up on your Lovecraftian lore, Haster is Cthulhu's brother. And their followers are continually at war with each other. And no one is sure sure why they attack each other on site, but they do. Um, so here we go, the first one. This one is for Cthulhu Invictus. And these could be played uh, separately from each other, or if you wanted to, you could uh, um, connect them all together. And they each of these scenarios, I don't know if they were designed for convention play, but um, 
the real uh, draw of this is that every one of these scenarios comes with uh, playable characters all ready to go. And then there's a nice little aside here for worship of Hester during the Roman period to uh, flesh out the flavor on that. Um, Herald of the Yellow King, scenario for Cthulhu Dark Ages. This is part two. And uh, so, well, some great European Dark Ages flavor with wolves. And some nice looking art here, grotesque but nice looking art. Um, the Beast People of Dunover. That's interesting. We'll see what that's all about. It's like we get like a little bit of a werewolf vibe, but I'm sure there's going to be a uh, Cthulhu esque spin on that. And uh, Spawn of Haster. A Bardric telling of the King in Yellow. That's really interesting. And so here we are at. Uh, more Dark Ages uh, characters. And then uh, a scenario for End Times Cthulhu. Yep, and so this is a scenario that would take place in 2145, a far future scenario. And what's interesting about this is that it has more of a uh, sci-fi bent to it. And so one of the things that I remember seeing when I was uh, um, first perusing this collection is that there's a... This is all taking place on a spaceship. So here we have the Tatterdemalion deep exploration spacecraft, and we have a nice deck plan for the spacecraft. And so, you know, just because it's a far future setting doesn't mean that there aren't horrors of the old ones that, uh, the great old ones that are involved here or the uh, outer gods. Uh, and so, yeah, we have more of a sci-fi theme to this adventure. And so, um, once again, even if I don't play this particular uh, scenario with the intent. Um, and it's worth noting here that uh, Ripples from Carcosa is another example of, uh, I think this came out in 2014, just as 7th edition was being released. So at the back of this, we have conversion guidelines, uh, advertisement for the invest the new investigator's handbook. Um, and so this is sort of a uh, um, uh, connecting uh, product between 6th edition and 7th edition, but it's so easy to convert 6th edition to 7th edition. It's very little record keeping, and even in an adventure, if I didn't do it ahead of time, because right now I'm running my group through uh, several classic Call of Cthulhu adventures. We've done The Haunting, uh, we just finished up Mansion of Madness, and uh, they're just about uh, to start a newer scenario that was published on Drive Through RPG. Um, yeah, so some nice handouts here in the back. Probably not as many handouts as one would expect for Call of Cthulhu scenarios. I would probably have to develop some more handouts for this to really flush it out. Um, but this one was on sale on Chaosium, which is why I bid on it. And so I got an actual physical book, which is always fun to read for 15 bucks. Plus I got the PDF for it. And so that's a nice one. And then last but certainly not least... Uh, we have uh, the House of Rillier, and these are scenarios that are based on tales by H.P. Lovecraft, specifically connected to some of his stories. You don't have to have read the stories in order to get uh, something out of these adventures, but uh, I think that it can help. And part of the reason why I got this collection is not only because it's a really meaty collection, because this is five scenarios, and we're looking at 200 pages, these are really meaty scenarios that are really complex plots. And so uh, since I've really been working over the last couple of years, especially to refine my GMing abilities and um, uh, really get some sophisticated stuff going for my players, I've been watching Seth Skorkowski's videos, which he has great advice. Um, and, whoops, so I'll just take out the receipt here so nobody sees any addresses. And um, But uh, I... I'm really interested in studying more complex adventures like the ones that are in this collection because um, I'm interested in, you know, bringing more sophisticated combinations of NPCs over time. I think I've already done a really solid job in my current campaign of establishing some ongoing NPCs that my, that my players have really been interested in. But it'll be interested to read how more complex adventures like these shake out. Because most, I would say the average scenario length for a Call of Cthulhu adventure, published scenario anyway, is around... Uh, 20 or so pages 
Um, so for example, uh, Scritch Scratch is the most recent, uh, it was the free RPG day adventure that came out here in June. Um, and that was kind of long for a free RPG day adventure. It was really nice. It was like 30 pages long. The scenarios in this book are like 40, 50 pages long. And if you're not used to running pre-published scenarios, um, especially for games like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, that wouldn't really surprise me. The, what I found that the real benefit of doing that for Call of Cthulhu is that since this is a really hefty investigative focused game, it saves a lot of time in developments of handouts and developments of clues so that I can be a little bit more efficient and just uh, rather than spend my time developing clues, I'm spending my time um, with uh, lots of stuff all set in pace. And so this adventure takes place in Providence, Rhode Island, an amazing historic city, and you get an amazing map of Providence, Rhode Island with this. Um, I've set up for my players in my group a uh, uh, scenario where they can go to Providence and investigate something. So this is going to be mineable material right now so that I can hand out a map of uh, for them to Providence. But there's, you know, a lot of uh, just generally mineable material here. And so if you want to uh, stick a cult church into a game, you could pull the free will church and its map and you're, you're ready to go. I mean, you don't have to play the scenarios uh, as written. And, I, you know, I mean, that's that's my big advice for somebody who's just starting out in role playing. There's I don't know what it is. There's like this idea circulating around in nerd circles that there's something sacred about published material, like the published material is canon and, and should be played according to to how it's laid out in a product. And I just don't subscribe to that at all. I, I mean, any material that you find that can be useful for your games, you should use that material however you want. There's nothing sacred about published adventures other than the fact that they're mineable material. Now, what I find really interesting about this book and looking through it is that I find the ink on the pages to be really reflective. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just something that really stands out to me, like that this is really reflective ink. And so I don't know um, if this was a publishing decision that they made or what, but um, uh, this is a sixth edition book. And you can tell that it's a sixth edition book because the stats are all from zero to 18. Um, and these values were all multiplied times five for seventh edition uh, to make it a little easier to relate to a D100 roll. Um, but that's the, the beauty of Call of Cthulhu is that all the past materials are usable. Um, and uh, you don't have to really worry at all about what edition they were published in. Any edition can be adapted. Um, and, you know, the reason is, is because these are all investigative stories and the nature of investigative stories isn't going to change over the decades. Uh, people love storytelling. And so I think that it's really... Um, great to be able to draw back on these uh i want to say older supplements but this supplement was published i think in 2013 so it's not really all that old but um compared to the new seventh edition that is that has uh been going on the last couple of years this is the last of the sixth edition supplements that that was out there the germine manor huntingdon oh all the floors are detailed including the dungeon i love it all right. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll get a lot of enjoyment of learning from these more developed adventures. Um, wow, this one has a ton of handouts to it. This one's taking place in Arabia, quote unquote. And so we got some globe trotting stuff happening here. Um, that'll be interested to see if there's anything that can be popped in. Check this out. The tunnels under Irem, the rub Alkali. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, there it is. So thanks for finding your way to RPG Imaginings. Um, I want to try to post more frequent videos than I have. I think that this is my first video in like six months. And I didn't intend to, to have it be this way, but, you know, I run another channel, and my other channel, my Mechanical Pencil channel, takes up most of my uh, recreation time. But um, I just wanted to... Uh, since I had not uh, posted a video in a while, just sort of do this unboxing of these great Call of Cthulhu uh, scenar uh, scenario collections that I'm going to be adding to my collection um, because I'm I'm not only playing Call of Cthulhu, I'm also uh, doing a little bit of collecting with it as well. And so uh, thanks for finding your way over here and uh, uh, hopefully you enjoy it. Have a great day.